You're listening to the Books Track Audiobooks, the channel that brings you to grow up your mind. Myself HT Sony. And today we will listening The Hidden Brain by Shankar Vedantam. Chapter 2 The Ubiquitous Shadow. Unconscious bias reaches into every corner of your life. At any given time, many dimensions of your hidden brain are at work. Some cooperate with one another, others clash. What is COMM onto all the actions of the hidden brain is the modesty with which it works. Like an attentive assistant that knows you better than you know yourself, the hidden brain anticipates your needs but claims no credit laying out your shirt, choosing your tie, or making your coffee. That is a wonderful convenience when tasks are mundane and heuristics are applied appropriately. It's when things go wrong, when heuristics are applied in error, or when the hidden brain makes an association that doesn't quite work, that we find ourselves asking, what was I doing, or what was I thinking? It happens to all of us, there are times when our actions are so at odds with our conscious beliefs and intentions that we don't quite know why we laughed aloud when someone made a mean-spirited joke, or why we lashed out in anger at someone we love. We can't explain why we set the alarm to go off at 6 p.m. instead of 6 a.m., or why we hit the gas pedal when we meant to hit the brake. We don't know why we choked during a big test or were tongue-tied when it came to standing up for ourselves in a dispute. Why didn't I say something? We wonder afterward. Why did I do that? How could I have been so foolish? This chapter aims to show how widely the effects of unconscious bias touch our everyday lives. The examples that follow are drawn from disparate domains, and show the hidden brain at work in a private setting, a professional setting, a social setting, and an intimate setting. The Spotlight Effect The beverage station was located in a non-script office in Newcastle in North, a stern England. It was no different from thousands of other office stations, where tea, coffee and milk were dispensed using an honoured system. A sheet of paper was posted on a cupboard door at eye level. Under the banner of a small photograph, the notice specified the cost of tea, 30 pence, coffee, 50 pence, and milk, 10 pence. People assembled their beverages and dropped money in an honor box. An office maven sent out emails every six months or so, reminding people to pay for their beverages. But like many other office stations, this one was located in a spot where people could not be observed. If they were honest and paid for their tea and coffee, no one gave them a pat on the back. If they did not pay, no one caught them. The setup had been in place for several years. Recently, without the knowledge of the several dozen people who used the beverage station, a researcher named Melissa Battison started tracking how much milk was dispensed each week. She also counted the money in the honor box. She did both things for 10 weeks. You would think the money collected would be roughly the same from week to week, especially if the office workers drank the same amount of tea and coffee. In the first and eighth week, in late January and mid-March, people drank the same amount of milk. But the honor box in the first week held 8 pounds and 25 pence. In the eighth week, it held 1 pound and 17 pence, seven times less. Did people decide to be more honest at the start? No, employees did not know Battison was studying their honesty. Besides, the money collected in the ninth week, in late March, was more than double the amount collected in the second week of the experiment, in early February. During half the study, weeks 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9, Battison collected three times as much as she did during weeks 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10. What was different about the odd-numbered weeks? Each week, Battison replaced the notice on the cupboard that reminded people to pay for their drinks. The text detailing the prices of coffee, tea, and milk was identical, but she changed the small decorative picture at the top of the notice. For the five odd-numbered weeks, Battison downloaded photos from the internet showing different pairs of watching eyes. Honesty levels soared. During even-numbered weeks, she printed pictures of different flowers, daisies, marigolds, roses. Honesty plummeted. Office workers were later quizzed about the notice. 
People shook their heads, mystified. No one had noticed the photo was different from week to week. Yet this subtle change produced a giant effect on honesty. When Battison subtly communicated that people were being watched, even if the eyes were only a grainy image downloaded from the internet, people were far more honest than when they poured their coffee in the company of marigolds. You could draw a small lesson and a large lesson from this experiment. The small lesson is that a picture showing a pair of eyes with a penetrating gaze seems to make people more honest in their private actions than a picture showing daisies. The big lesson is that people are powerfully influenced by things that they never consciously register. The workers did not notice the photographs, yet they were influenced by them. Why did people fail to notice that marigolds had been replaced by a photo showing a pair of eyes? Think about it this way, your attention is like a spotlight that can illuminate anything you choose to focus on. But the spotlight can't illuminate everything at the same time. If you are thinking about work or an office conversation, you might not notice that the photograph on the wall shows a pair of eyes or a flower. If you remember to pay attention to the decor, you don't notice it is brighting outside, and people have been shown to give larger tips, make more aggressive investments, and generally report more optimism about their lives and romantic relationships when it is bright and sunny, compared to when it is overcast. In fact, if you were to make a detailed inventory of everything you could possibly focus on at any given moment, the list would run to dozens of pages. There are very smells and tastes, ideas, moods and tones of voice. Focusing on any one thing is trivial, focusing on everything at the same time is impossible. If you really did sit down to make that inventory, you would see that at any given moment, you are not aware of most of the cues around you. Right now, for example, you are reading and the thinking about the words on this page. But until I remind you about it, you are not paying attention to the texture of the book jacket, or whether the temperature is right. You can, of course, refocus the beam of your attention on anything but doing so means something else will disappear from the spotlight. So as the spotlight of your conscious attention moves to other things, your hidden brain remains vigilant to your peripheral vision. In situations that do not require conscious intervention, the hidden brain simply responds to what it sees without informing you about what it has done. When and it comes to a notice posted on a cupboard, the hidden brain notices the small picture on the notice has changed from week to week. Since the hidden brain specializes in rapid analyses and lacks the sophistication to distinguish between a photograph and an actual pair of eyes, it subtly prompts you to behave as if you were really being watched. What happens to things that are outside the spotlight of our conscious attention? They don't vanish altogether, because this would be dangerous. It would be irritating to be reminded about your peripheral vision all the time, because much of the time nothing important is happening there but you want to be notified about important things. The Irresistible Heuristic A few thousand miles from Newcastle, another experiment was underway at the same time Melissa Battison was tracking her beverage station. Economists have long puzzled over how investors deal with new entrants to the stock market. There is no mystery when it comes to a well-known company such as Google going public, investors know a lot about such companies. But in many cases, New stocks are volatile because investors are still learning about companies. Rumors s about internal company developments and earnings can send prices spiraling upward or can trigger a rush for the exit. Mathematic Ians have come up with complicated formulas to track changes, and have developed algorithms to predict minute decimal shifts in share prices. When billions of dollars of stock are traded each day, small differences mean enormous profits and losses. Psychologists Adam Alter and Daniel Oppenheimer recently decided to try their hand at this game. Did they study the complexities of the stock exchange, the underlying strength of companies, and oil futures? No, no, and no. Did they have vast encyclopedic knowledge of where the economy was headed? Nope. Did they have insider information? Decidedly not. The psychologists looked at whether companies had names that were pronounceable or names that were unpronounceable. They presented a group of a volunteers with a series of made-up company names that would wrap your tongue in knots, Ejadux and Zajipton, Mextscry and Bolio, as well as a set of company names that were easy to pronounce, 
such as Gilman and Clearman, Barnings and Tanley. If the companies Quion and Eulimnius were like complex paintings from Vincent van Gogh's dark period, full of dark skies and menacing colors, the companies Adderley and Dearbond were like paintings brought home from school by happy five-year-olds, a yellow sun with a smiley face peering down on a house with a puff of smoke coming out the chimney. Alter and Oppenheimer found that without their awareness, volunteers were influenced by the names of companies they studied. They tended to overvalue companies with easy names and undervalue companies with difficult names. But surely names would not affect how companies fared on the real stock market? What sane investor would base investment decisions names? Alter and Oppenheimer tracked 10 stocks with easy to pronounce names and 10 stocks with hard to pronounce names on the New York Stock Exchange. They found that companies with easy to pronounce names outperformed companies with hard to pronounce names by 11.2% on their very first day of trading. After six months, the difference was more than 27%. After a year, it was more than 33%. If you'd put a million dollars into the stocks with easy names and a million dollars into the stocks with hard names, the group with easy names would have outperformed the group with difficult names by $330,000. It got better, or worse, depending on your point of view. Instead of looking at names, Alter and Oppenheimer looked at companies' ticker symbols. A review of share of prices on the New York Stock Exchange and the American Stock Exchange showed that companies with easy to pronounce stock ticker codes such as CAR outperformed companies with hard to pronounce ticker codes, such as RDO, by 8.5% on their first day of trading and by more than 2% after one year of trading. Remember the math, Madakians who track the market? They get excited by differences in decimal points. Two percentage points is big money. Alter and Oppenheimer found the pronounceability effect went away with time. Once investors learn about the companies, they start basing decisions on more important things than names. Pronounceability matters only until investors develop proficiency in the skills that really matter. But why would investors base their initial to a decisions on something as trivial as a name? Unlike with the office workers in Newcastle, you don't have to ask whether investors were aware that they were being influenced by the names of companies. They were not. If they'd known about the bias, they would have compensated for it, and the difference in stock performance would have vanished. Like the beverage drinkers in Newcastle, the investors that Alter and Oppenheimer studied felt they were making deliberate choices. Without their awareness, however, their decisions were swayed. Their hidden brains associated the names of companies that were easy to pronounce with a sense of comfort, and the names of companies that were difficult to pronounce with a sense of discomfort. Comfort is linked to familiarity and safety, which is why investors chose some stocks and drove up the prices. S. Discomfort is associated with risk and unfamiliarity which is why investors avoided those stocks and undervalued them. Applying heuristics, shortcuts linking comfort with safety and discomfort with risk to situations for which they have not been designed is a recipe for trouble. The Three-Legged Race I recently typed in De Kramer 142 Herlin, 64 12 p.m. into Google Earth. I saw the planet on my screen slowly spin. The Atlantic Ocean passed by in half a second England was a blip, the English Channel a droplet of water on the side of my glass. Cities and local landmarks emerged and I zoomed in on trees, roads, and cars in the town of Heerlen in the Netherlands. Google Earth didn't tell me this, but the rooftop on my computer screen was an IKEA store. Across from the IKEA was an Applebee's restaurant with about 30 tables inside. The restaurant was family-friendly, casual, and moderately priced. Inside the restaurant, a waitress took orders. She was about 17 or 18 years old. When customers asked for beer and fries the waitress wrote down the order and repeated it verbatim. Beer, she echoed, or fry it. When other customers asked for beer, the waitress said pills, a Dutch synonym for beer. For fry it, she said pat it, another synonym. She wrote down every order. For one group of customers, the waitress mimicked the customer's verbatim. For another group, she acknowledged their orders by using a synonym and saying yes. Tips given by the customers were counted. When the waitress mimicked customers, her tip went up. 
the difference was not trivial. On average, customers who were mimicked gave the waitress tips that were 140% larger. The waitress did not know the aim of the experiment, so it was not as though she treated one set of customers better than the other. I called a Dutch psychologist Rick Van Baren, who conducted the study. He told me mimicry works best when it follows the natural rhythms of conversation. If you instantly repeat what someone tells you, it will be obvious and irritating, like a five-year-old repeating back to you everything you say. But when you repeat what you hear after a short delay you communicate something important, I am listening to you. I have understood you. I agree with you. What is fascinating is that the waitress communicated exactly those things to the other customers, too. By using synonyms and saying yes, she told these customers that she had heard them and understood their instructions. By writing down every order, she emphasized that she would accurately communicate the orders to kitchen staff but language is more than just verbal information. Much of what we say goes beyond the literal meaning of the words we use. Using tone, inflection, and various patterns of speech, we communicate affection, anger and gratitude, loneliness and longing. I am not drawing your attention to the well-known difference between verbal and non-verbal communication. I am drawing your attention to the difference between conscious and unconscious communication. Without their awareness, customers who were they mimicked felt they received better service. The next time you are in a park, a restaurant, or an office, watch any two people talking. The more in sync they are, the more likely they will be to subtly mimic each other. If you get close enough to hear what they are saying, you might hear them repeating each other's phrases. They might even have the same rhythms of speech, the same body language, their hidden brains are prompting them to reflect concordance. When people hear something they agree with they respond enthusiastically and quickly. When they hear something they disagree with, they are microseconds slower to respond, because the hidden brain knows that an impasse lies ahead and is girding for the conflict. The psychologists Tanya Chartrand and John Barg once videotaped people in conversation with a lab assistant. The assistant was instructed to rub her face or shake her foot throughout the conversation. The videotape revealed the subjects of the study rubbing their faces and shaking their feet in response. When quizzed later on, none of the people remembered adopting these tics. Nor did they report noticing the assistant's face rubbing and foot shaking. Unlike psychologists who deliberately manipulate behavior to see what effect it has on others, most of our modulations in speech and action happen unconsciously and unintentionally in the course of the everyday communication. I unconsciously respond to your unconscious signals, and you to mine. The fact that neither of us is aware of this dance does not mean it is irrelevant. Remember, even as the Applebee's customers and the waitress were exchanging information at a deliberate and explicit level, orders and acknowledgement for beer and fries, they were also exchanging information at an unconscious and unintentional level. If you looked only at the explicit information exchanged, you would not understand why some customers gave extra generous tips. When we hear about the Newcastle Beverage Station or the volunteers who rub their faces and shake their feet in response to a lab assistant's actions, or an eyewitness who makes an obvious error, we can't help but feel we would never be susceptible to such manipulation. Of course we would notice that the person sitting before us was shaking her foot or rubbing her face. The photo obviously shows a pair of eyes one week and marigolds the next. The rapist's teeth are straight, the suspects are the crooked. The cues are not hidden. When Dutch psychologist Rick Van Baren came up with his Applebee's experiment, the waitress was initially reluctant to participation because she felt the mimicry would be obvious. Customers would ask her what the hell she thought she was doing. Of course, no one did. What the restaurant experiment reveals is that your hidden brain does not work in isolation. It forms networks with other hidden brains. I unconsciously pick up the unconscious cues you send me, and I unconsciously respond to them. Without being aware of it, we are constantly adapting to different contexts and people, modulating not just our rhythms of speech, but the very content of our ideas. This effect is especially powerful in situations where people are trying to form emotional connections, when you want to create a bond with another person, your hidden brain subtly whispers, say this or don't say that. 
the selfish brain. Two friends of mine are prominent Alzheimer's disease researchers. John Trojanowski and Virginia Lee Co. direct the University of Pennsylvania's research on neurodegenerative disorders. But what I want to tell you about these scientists does not have to do with neurofibrillary tangles and beta amyloid plagues. It has to do with John and Virginia themselves. John speaks in full sentences. He is attentive to detail in everyday conversation. When I interviewed him some years ago for an investigative article, the picture he painted was like a John L. E. Kerr spy story, intricate, detailed, subtle. Listening to John was like watching a painter develop a canvas, only instead of brush and paint John employed a series of perfectly thought out sentences. He included so much detail that I found myself having to concentrate really hard to pick out the important points. Like any good L.E. Care novel, John's account was not about bombs and car chases and hijacked airplanes but about the passing detail of an unlatched gate. At first glance, John and Virginia seem like an odd couple. He is six foot three inches tall, looks a little like Mick Jagger and is expansively genial. She is of Asian ancestry, petite, and has the coiled restraint of a cat. At second glance, they look even more like an odd couple. Where John is verbose, Virginia is staccato. When they get angry, he exudes icy dignity and she flashes fire. John follows a simple rule in everyday conversation why say something in one sentence when you can say it in two? Virginia strips language to its tensile outlines, eliminating subjects and objects in most sentences, and waging an unrelenting war of annihilation against all modifiers. When she says yes, or no, her eyes bristling with impatience, you have the sense that what she really means to say would take ten minutes but she can't spare that kind of time. When Virginia's angry with you, one friend of theirs told me, it's like she's going to take a knife and slit your throat. When John's angry with you, he'll make you feel so guilty that you will take a knife and slit your own throat. A friend calls us fire and ice, John said. You can guess which is which. I once visited John and Virginia's lab. As I was talking with an office administrator, Virginia rushed up. Here, she said, and dropped a folder before the administrator, whose name was Karen Engel. We'll talk about it tomorrow. She whirled and was gone. John would have talked about it for ten minutes, Engel said, nodding at the folder. He is not one to make rash decisions. He wants consensus. Perhaps you know people like John and Virginia, they're clashing perhaps you know people like John and Virginia, their clashing personalities are a cliché of television sitcoms. Experts in human relationships will tell you that while such clashing personalities are good for comedy, they are definitely not good in real life. People like John and Virginia who clash, disagree and get on each other's nerves because they have different personalities are exactly the kind of people who should never be left alone in a room together. As colleagues, experts will say, people like John and Virginia are doomed to conflict. And if a professional relationship between people like them is likely to be doomed, a personal relationship between them would be a catastrophe. Don't think rancor and bitterness, think mushroom clouds. What I haven't told you about John and Virginia is that they have been married to each other for more than 30 years. And more than most couples I know who have been married half as long, it is obvious they are very much in love. Opposites attract, you say. Research studies contradict you on that, at least in that studies show that similar people tend to get along better in the long run, but never mind. Let's assume opposites do attract. What I find astonishing about John and Virginia is that they not only live together and love each other, but they have formed a potent professional partnership that has placed them among the ranks of the most prolific and widely respected scientists in the world. At Penn, John and Virginia collaborate to produce dozens of research papers in prestigious scientific journals. They haul in millions of dollars in grants. Everything they do is in concert, collaboration and consultation with each other. Someday, admirers whisper, they might win the Nobel Prize in medicine, together. Bear in mind that this is a couple that argues about minutiae. Neither will give ground on such all-important questions as whether the forks should go in theta washer with their pointy ends up or their pointy ends down. 
When John and Virginia clash, they revert to personality. John becomes more and more precise attending to tinier and tinier details, his emotions hidden behind layers of ice. Virginia grows more and more didactic, interrupting John and showing considerable exasperation at his verbal pyrotechnics. When they spar, I can see her mentally pick up projectiles and fling them at him while he sits, steely-faced and impassive, green peas whizzing by his nose. When they went on vacation recently, they argued about the right way to make breakfast cereal. When he tried to recall what the fight was about some days later, John came up short. It was so trivial he could barely remember the details, except that the fight was not only heated, but a recurring conflict every day of their vacation. If you had seen them during these breakfast cereal duels you would not have guessed that together in their professional life John and Virginia have bucked the Neurothesians community on the causes of Alzheimer's disease. They have often been willing to stake out ground that is at odds with the conventional wisdom the kind of position that requires them to depend on each other for intellectual and emotional support. Taking such gambles in science is not easy. It is a little like being lost at sea, menacing grey-green water from horizon to horizon and striking off in one direction on your own, while all the other boats head off together in the opposite direction. It needs confidence and it needs each member of the couple to have complete trust in the other. In everyday life, however, friends and co-workers do not wonder how John and Virginia work so well together. They wonder how John and Virginia can coexist. I imagine a marital counselor giving advice to John and D. Virginia. After hearing about the breakfast cereal fights, I see him wondering about whether the two of them are really suited for each other. John, for example, will start to describe how his day goes, we get up at 7 o'clock. We get up at 7.30, Virginia sharply interrupts John, you think that you wake up at 7. The marital counselor raises his eyebrows imperceptibly. They argue about small things, he says to himself. Do they give each other lots of space? No. He learns that they share their professional lives, going from the same house to the adjacent cubicles in the same office. Do they gingerly avoid each other in their professional life? No. They are often at each other's throats in public. I've never encountered the volatility I see between them, a lab manager named Jennifer Bruce once told me. If it happens often enough, people just say, oh, they're at it again. Bob Dome, another colleague, told me that he was taken aback when he first met the couple. Virginia is hyperkinetic. And John always speaks very slowly, so Virginia is always telling him to shut up or get on with it. I was shocked when I first met them. I didn't know they were married. Even their jokes have an edge. At a lab meeting with two dozen people in attendance, John once talked about the role that brain injuries might play in the development of Alzheimer's disease. He explained that the insidious thing about these injuries is that their effects might not be visible, even to highly sophisticated brain scanners. I fell off a horse when I was 16 and I had a brief amnesia he said it went away, but that's the kind of thing that predisposes somebody to Alzheimer's disease. I haven't taken an MRI brain scan but even if I did, I wouldn't find anything. How do you know? Virginia asked, deadpan. The room erupted in laughter, and John looked displeased. I see the marital counselor shaking his head as he learns from John that their heated criticisms of each other at work regularly bring them both to the brink of tears. When we don't agree, it is not really clashing, Virginia interrupts, disagreeing with her husband about whether they disagree with each other. If I don't agree with him, I tell him. I see our imaginary therapist leaning back in his chair with a heavy sigh when he realizes the only thing that keeps them from each other's throats is traffic safety. We have one very important rule, we still bicycle to work, John told me. Whatever we discuss, we cannot fight on our bicycles, because that is dangerous. But John and Virginia also have a secret, perhaps the most important secret that extraordinarily talented type A couples can have. To understand what it is, I want to introduce you to the work of a social psychologist named Abraham Tesser. Some years ago, a young woman approached Tesser and told him that she had done well in a recent class but was feeling awful because a close friend of hers had done even better. 
social psychologists are always on the lookout for behaviors that are not idiosyncratic to individuals but that say something about human nature in a general. Tesser sympathized with the woman who confided in him, but her remark got him thinking, would the woman have felt as bad if the person who had outperformed her had not been a close friend? Alternatively, if the friend had done well at something that the woman did not care about herself, would she have experienced jealousy? Tessieris intuitively guessed the answer to both questions was no. When a stranger does well at something, we can enjoy their accomplishments. In fact, when we know something about basketball or poetry, we are better able to understand the skill involved in dunking a ball or turning a rhyme. Most of us take great pleasure in watching gifted athletes and performers do things we could never dream of doing ourselves. When close friends or lovers do well in activities that do not interest us, the same thing happens. The wife who would never be caught dead in a garden can take pride in her green-thumbed husband who has turned the backyard into a horticultural exhibit, the aspiring high school football star feels his chest puff with pride when his younger sister is chosen for the lead role in the school play. In fact, Tesser sensed that in these situations, people feel happy partly because they get to bask in reflected glory. There is my cousin, who is the first violinist in the symphony. A person might think. Or, there is my son, the doctor. But something interesting, and potentially unpleasant, happens when someone whom we are close to excels in a domain where we would like to be seen as excellent ourselves. The writer who is outshone by his writer girlfriend feels a conflict. He feels pleasure at the success of someone he loves and gets some reflected glory, but he also feels taken down a peg. He doesn't want reflected literary glory, he wants his own literary glory. This is why the 12-year-old who gets bumped from the lead role in the school play is likely to come home bemused if she loses the starring role to a stranger, but is likely to come home in tears if she loses the part to her twin sister. If the relationship is close, the jealousy gets even worse, Tesser told me. You have these two reactions to the other person, your success pulls me up, but on the other hand, your success makes me feel like crapola. Tesser conducted a series of experiments that confirmed his hunches. At its core, the conflict between pride and jealousy in other people's accomplishments hinges on a mechanism in the hidden brain designed to watch out for our narrow selfish interests. We show ourselves in a positive light when we excel at something, but we are also seen positively when we are associated with someone who excels, the brother of the beauty pageant winner is not just another guy. Some of his sister's glory rubs off on him. Usually these two mechanisms in the hidden brain are not in conflict. Tesser's insight was that when someone who is close to us excels at something that we want to excel at ourselves, these two drives are unconsciously put into conflict with each other. The glory of our successful friends and siblings rubs off on us. But because we hunger for their kind of glory ourselves, their success makes us feel mediocre. This is why the woman who confided in Tesser was upset at being outperformed by a close friend. Tesser found that people feel very powerful resentment when their partners are successful in a domains that are integral to their own identity. This resentment is so powerful that volunteers in experiments sabotage their friends and lovers to keep them from doing well at things the volunteers see as their own core strengths. Wordsmiths presented with a test of verbal ability, for example, will help strangers and undermine their lovers, in order to keep partners from outperforming them. Although husbands and wives say they are unrestrainedly happy about the successes of their partners, Videotaped interviews show that people's expressions of pleasure are leavened with dismay when they find their spouses have outdone them in domains they want to claim as their own. The people Tesser studied were not bad people, they had no awareness of what they were doing. Like the woman who approached Tesser to ask why it was she felt dismayed her friend had outperformed her, these husbands and wives were not consciously aware of why they felt the way they did. Not only would they not be able to explain their behavior to others, they would not be able to explain their behavior to themselves, which is how it always is with the hidden brain. In one especially interesting analysis, Tessa examined the relationships between famous male scientists and their fathers. He found that when the father and son were scientists in the same field, the success of the son predicted an emotionally distant parent-child relationship. When father and son were in different fields, 
the to success of the son predicted emotional closeness with the father. Even when it comes to our own children, in other words having a child outperform us in a domain where we have long sought excellence ourselves can be threatening to our self-esteem. All fathers bask in the reflected glory of their son's successes, but when a father and son share similar interests, a persistent voice at the back of the father's head asks why such success was denied to him. All this, as you might guess, spells trouble for two people like John Trojanowski and Virginia Lee. They are married to the each other, which means they are close, and their professional lives and feelings of achievement are tied up in the same things. They are both smart, ambitious, and competitive. It's not just that both of them are academics. One of them is not doing social science while the other does clinical science. No, they are both in exactly the same field, working in the same as the university out of the same office. They even have the same job title. Given the differences in their personalities, Tessers' research would predict that John and the Virginia would quickly become envious of each other, and that jealousy and competitiveness would poison their relationship. But as I said, John and Virginia have a secret. It can be summed up in a single word, complementarity. Although they appear to be doing identical things and have identical interests, John and Virginia have figured out how to do slightly different things, to divide up their everyday tasks so that they work in complementary ways rather than competitive ways. They have unconsciously harnessed the selfishness of the hidden brain to their mutual advantage. They have agreed, for example, that she is they work in complementary ways rather than competitive ways. They have unconsciously harnessed the selfishness of the hidden brain to their mutual advantage. They have agreed, for example, that she is the expert when it comes to biochemistry and cell biology, the basic tools of bench science. They have also agreed that he is the expert on clinical issues, and a lot of scientific work involves working with patients. They have also divided up the human resources needs of running a large laboratory, which is like a small business. Virginia thinks of herself as being a lab rat, and there is nothing she likes as much as discussing science with postdoctoral fellows. John is much more social and enjoys talking to collaborators, the press, and the outside world. The strategy to make sure our partnership did not undermine each other was not do the same thing, John said. We have different skill sets and different management skill sets. Even though we say we work with each other all the time, we have to get appointments to see each other. It never started out as, this is what I do and this is what you do. It started out as this is what we do together, Virginia added. It naturally sorted out. If. At the end of the day, I am not in town, John can substitute for me. We don't really stake out an area but go with whoever is better at it. Given how similar their interests are and the extremely competitive structure of modern science, it is astonishing that John and Virginia have perfectly complementary strengths. But Tessers' research suggests blind luck probably played a modest role in their division of responsibilities. When couples are emotionally close, Tesser found they automatically and unconsciously stake out complementary domains. It is almost as though, recognizing the potential threat that competitiveness poses to an intimate relationship, the hidden brain nudges people toward complementarity. Tesser found that if one partner has a strong preference to do task A over task B, but the other partner has an even stronger preference for task A, the first person unconsciously switches preferences and says he actually prefers task B. On his own, John might well have been a lab rat and Virginia an outgoing communicator, but in the context of their relationship they have unconsciously adopted roles that allow them to see each other as collaborators instead of competitors. John and Virginia have also, consciously and deliberately, set up rules to reduce the risk of competitiveness. By specializing in different tasks, all of which are the essential to the functioning of their laboratory, they have increased their dependence on each other. John knows he needs the engine of bench science that Virginia to provides, Virginia knows she needs the engine of research grants and collaborations that John generates. Every publication that goes out from their lab has both their names on it. They both insist all recognition be shared equally, and are prepared to make sacrifices to see that this happens. John once applied for a prestigious million-dollar grant that neither he nor Virginia thought was within their reach. 
To their surprise, John won the grant. But before he accepted, he told the organizers the grant would have to have both their names on it. The private organization giving out the grant balked, after all, John had applied for the grant on his own. John told the group that unless the grant was given to them both, he was going to turn down the million dollars. Initially they did not want to do it, and I said, sorry. We don't want the money, John told me. The organization relented and gave the grant to both of them. Neither of us would do as well on our own, Virginia agreed. But together we work very well. People tell me, you don't do anything unless Virginia gives you permission, John added. What it is, is there is no single boss in our operation at work or home, and to some men that seems weak. I don't mind acknowledging that nothing he have accomplished would have been possible without Virginia. I am skeptical about the accuracy of this claim. John and Virginia are immensely talented people and would very likely have been successful if they had never become partners. But I am certain that their belief in this claim is essential to the success of their personal and professional partnership. With all their personality the differences, John and Virginia have to see their individual success as intertwined with the success of the other person. Absent that belief, that bias, they would lose a very important pillar of their love. The unconscious bias of the hidden brain to look out for itself can be an immensely destructive force in personal relationships, but it can also be harnessed to create dense networks of interdependence. Unlike most couples who have been married for more than three decades, John and Virginia hate spending a single night away from each other. When either is invited to give a talk in another city, each invariably arranges for the other to come along, too, like opposite poles of two magnets that cannot get enough of each other. This was Chapter 2, Thank You for Listening. Subscribe for listening more amazing audiobooks like this.